International weather experts are projecting an El Nino phase during this summer season, and it's likely to result in the opposite impact on weather and climate patterns in many regions of the world. Now, they warn of increased heat and drought in places like South Africa or heavy rainfall in other regions. Climate change uh, remains a hot topic, and we continue to debate on these conditions. To continue the conversation, we're joined this hour by climate scientist Nkosnati Kulu. Thank you very much for your time time this afternoon in Kosnati and I mean we've seen extreme weather patterns across many parts of South Africa most recently the Western Cape and what we're seeing in Georgia at the moment and I'm just wondering when we talk about El Nino and the opposite reactions from what we would have originally thought would happen what exactly is it that we can expect to see here over the next short to medium term? Thank you, uh, Ro. Good afternoon to your viewers. Well, uh, the El Nino phase is an occurrence which is happening uh, on the equatorial Pacific. Uh, when we look at the Pacific Ocean, which is the largest ocean uh, in the world, uh, there is telecommunication. Uh, when you find uh, there are conditions with such surface temperatures over the Pacific, they tend to, tend to affect our region, uh, specifically South Africa. So if you read uh, the the current report from the South African Weather Services, which is the custodian of our weather in South Africa, you find that they forecasted that there is going to be an El Nino. And we have seen in the past that an El Nino phase is usually associated with dry and drought conditions of our regions, where you find that there is prolonged dryness, there is occurrence of heat waves. But uh, interesting enough, the current projections through the SCM model which they use is that the northeastern part is going to be wet than expected. So there's, those are interesting uh, forecasts which we need to look at and try to warn people that the conditions that are going to occur are not likely what we usually experience when we're having an El Nino phase over our region. But we also need to note that the occurrence of an El Nino does have a, a telecommunication with the South Indian Ocean, what we refer to as the Indian Ocean Dipole. So you find that when we are likely to have an El Nino, uh, the Indian Ocean will respond because we know that the El Nino for our region is a source of moisture. We tend to get moisture from the Indian Ocean because there's that interaction between the Indian Ocean and the atmosphere, which brings moisture from the Indian Ocean to our region. But it's very interesting that the weather service, the model that they're using, they are saying that uh, the northeastern part where we find that it's going to be wetter than normal, which is really interesting going forward into the summer season that will start in December, January, February. So when we talk about the wet season, because the dry season is, I suppose, is fairly understood, but when we talk about the wet um, a, a season or the rainy season, um, are these extreme flood conditions that we might be exposed to once again? Like I say, we've seen instances of this, not just in KZN, but the Western Cape um, and what we're reporting on later on this afternoon, George. Um, are those the kind of conditions that we will be seeing? If you uh, apply your memory quite uh, to the 2000s, you can see that extreme events have been occurring much more frequently. What we now talk about is the new normal. If you might recall in 2019, there was a cut of flow uh, which damaged infrastructure and caused fatalities. And also last year in 2022, there was another, uh, another occurrence of a cut of flow which brought another devastating condition of wetness and flooding uh, over urban areas. You can now see that even urban areas are now being affected by these extreme weather conditions. It's no longer the norm where we say the rural areas are the much more affected because they are exposed uh, to vulnerability and other conditions. So now when looking at this, you can really see that, uh, but when we speak of uh, a seasonal forecast, it's really difficult to go into day by day and say, are we really going to have a flood on a specific date, yes or no? What we really look at is an amalgamation of everything that can occur within a particular season. But as I said before, that the extreme conditions are really happening much more frequently. So we can expect that these dry and um, these wet conditions, which are going to happen in the northeastern north part, might be associated with occurrences of cattle flows, might be uh, associated with the inland penetration of uh, cold fronts. If you have seen that 
Back in the day, we used to know the cold fronts uh, are a phenomenon that happens in summer and they uh, uh, affect the Western Cape much more frequently. But now we can see that they now penetrate more inland. They come more inland. They reach, they reach places such as Gauteng. They reach places such as Limpopo, for example. So these extreme conditions are really becoming a reality and are happening much more frequently. So I would say uh, people must really be uh, in on the lookout. They must read all the, uh, the reports or all the warnings from the weather service so they can see what really could bring this wet, uh, these wet conditions over the northeastern parts as forecasted by the weather service. Mm, and I suppose one of the things we'll have to look out for as well in Kosnati is the duration which these patterns last for because one would assume that they are lasting for longer and longer than we would traditionally be used to. You've just alluded to the frequency of them and now I'm just thinking about the duration at which they last. Yes, quite correctly. Uh, in January, uh, we here in the Zululand region in KZN, we had a prolonged heat wave which lasted for about uh, a number of days, four or five days if I'm not mistaken, and people were exposed to very intense heat. And we know that weather conditions are associated with a lot of occurrences. Uh, for example, uh, the health sector. Uh, so you find that when you're having flooding, you are likely to have waterborne diseases. Uh, when you are having heat, you are likely to have people being exposed and having skin, disorder, uh, skin disorders as a result of such. So you see that the occurrence of weather conditions and these patterns, which are becoming much more frequent, is not only a affecting one sector in our country. We find that even agriculture tends to be affected because farmers need to plan. They need to know what type of crops they need to, they need to plant or they need to, uh, uh, to, 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 to invest on in an upcoming summer season. So you find that with the likely dryness that has been happening when you're having an El Nino, people have been uh, instructed or they've been uh, given advice that they must grow drought-resistant crops, such as sorghum, for example. So you find that these forecasts really help a lot of sector, the economic sector, the agricultural sector, and also the health sectors of people can be worn, what we refer to as early warning systems. So you find that they are being prolonged, they are happening much more frequently, and we need to be on the lookout. But another thing, another point that I would like to raise is that the skill of the forecast is very good. And what we need to focus on now is the communication of climate information. For example, when we say there's going to be 90% chances of rainfall, what does 90% mean to a person who's on the ground? Because we know that probability is an expression, is an expression of uncertainty. What happens if that 90% does not happen and the 10% happens because we are using probability. So we need to really focus on trying to educate people how to understand and relay climate information so that they can make better decisions going forward, whether it might be agriculture or the health sector or the economic sector. And we also know with the issues uh, of load shading, you find that uh, people are, uh, are relying uh, on electricity equipment. For example, when there's a heat wave, you need to have a, an aircon on what really happens when there is load shedding, for example, or in cold conditions. How do you keep warm when there is uh, insufficient uh, supply of uh, electricity? So those are the issues that we really need to sit on the round table and discuss them going forward and incorporate climate information so that we can make good decisions at the end. Thank you very much for those very interesting insights. That is Nkosnati Kulu, who is a climate scientist at the University of Zululand.